Good day everyone, Grimmels here with another video of From the Depths. I really enjoy this game and I want to make a few more videos of it. And I was asked in the comments of the last video to show how the design progresses as well as the campaign I started in my first video of From the Depths. So without further ado, let's do just that. In the last video I showed you the first iteration of my Madcat class attack frigate, as well as Smart Torpedo Boat, which I built for the early stages of the campaigns and missions. Now my little PT torpedo boat I have not changed since the last video, as it is just meant to be a cheap starting unit and is not that important and I have not spent that much time on it. Maybe I will revisit that one later too though. I do have a few ideas for improving it, especially adding some anti-aircraft armament, as especially versus the deep water guard there are some air units early on in the campaign, which the current torpedo boat design has trouble dealing with. We will see. Now, the Madcat class frigate however has changed a bit since the last video, as there were a few things I was not satisfied with with the original design and wanted to change, and the Madcat catamaran frigate is meant to be a primary ship in say the early to mid game of a campaign, like the one I'm currently playing as a fast attack ship scout as well as damage dealer, and I think in its current configuration it can handle the job quite well. So the Mad Cat I wanted to take another quick look at in its current form. And there is also a new ship class I designed over the last week I wanted to introduce, a cruiser to complement my fleet, but we will take a look at that one later. But let's start by taking a look at some of the changes I made to my catamaran frigate. Now compared to last week, the primary change is the configuration of the guns. I originally had two single barrel turrets side by side, which I already mentioned I wanted to replace with a new triple barrel turret in the middle and I have done so. That meant that I had to move the laser guided missiles from between the turret to a new spot and I took some inspiration from the battle deck mad cat here and moved them to the side of the bridge. There is also two of them now doubling the amount of missile pods in the rear. In order to give the guns a clearer field of fire to the front, I also removed the vertical launch cells for the radar guided missiles that used to be in front of the two hulls and moved them back around the turret, again increasing their number. The two single power 180mm guns and sponsons on the side I originally had on the ship had a very bad field of fire and were not very effective, so I replaced them with a new design which has a better field of fire and also added gun ports to cover them up while traveling, which open up when the ship is in combat. Now I also added a missile defense system, an anti-missile laser in front of the bridge where the old six-shot missile launcher used to be with the laser generator being below the bridge running its entire length. Now, the laser can also be used as a short-range anti-ship laser. The laser is very inaccurate in that role as it is very short, but when the ship gets too close for the missiles to be accurately used and anti-missile defense no longer necessary, the laser can be employed in an anti-ship role instead. The torpedo armament of the ship stayed the same, with four forward-facing tubes and eight to the rear. Internally we have mostly detail changes, the bridge got slightly thicker armor and I added a few extra bulkheads and doors and the hulls to keep flooding in check. Still though, the ship is not very well armored, it's meant to be a light unit, a fast attack ship that best attacks in a group and most of its protection is based on redundant systems. It has for example one primary AI core in the bridge and two secondary ones in the hull that can take over in case the bridge gets hit. The same goes for the ship's detection equipment, with the underwater sonar being able to take over detection in case the main sensor mast takes a hit and vice versa. The main turret also has a coincidence rangefinder on it which can help with tracking targets when the more sophisticated tracker equipment is taken out. Now here we are in one of the two engine rooms, with the secondary gun and one of the main fuel engines in it. The power the two large main engines provide is now better used, since I have a shield system on the ship which draws power. Again though, one of the engines can power the ship alone if the other one gets hit, and I have two emergency electrical engines in the front of the two hulls with enough power to run the ship for a while if both fuel engines take a hit. So while the ship is pretty weakly armored, it can often still fight with quite a lot of the ship missing, thanks to its redundant systems. and. That is an ability that got put to the test quite a few times already during the campaign I'm currently playing. Well, and speaking of, now that I have given you an update on the Mad Cat class frigate and its current state, let's take a look at what happened in the campaign since last time. 
Now in the Onyx Watch campaign we started in the last video, we last time defended our base versus first attack with our little torpedo boat and captured an enemy vessel in the process, which I used to defend against some more attacks while building my first own frigate, and eventually scrapped the capture ship in order to build a second Mad Cat as well, the Vulture. I also moved my base to another resource zone where I could get resources faster, however only for a limited time, and the weather in this part of the map is usually pretty awful too. At this point in the campaign I'm still mostly on the defensive, defending against attacks while building up resources to expand my fleet and go on the offensive myself. Now, Madcat and Vulture do a good job at defending my base for now, but also often take some significant damage going up against often much larger opposition. After all, many of the enemy ships I meet by now in this campaign outmass my little frigates by a factor of 5 or 10. In this fight here, for example, Mad Cat got hit so bad by the broadside of an enemy ship that the front part of the ship was only held on by a single steel beam. If that would have failed as well, the whole ship would have broken apart in the middle, though the ship did actually keep firing its main gun in this state till the battle was over. Shows that the built-in redundancy works, with the backup AI in the front of the ship taking over as the connection to the main one was lost, and the backup electric engines taking over the power supply. Still, it became clear that the Madcats, which are designed as light attack craft, will need some backup against larger enemy designs, especially since we soon get proper castle ships as well position as well. It became clear that I need something that can go 1 vs 1 vs larger enemy ships and other units and soak up damage while the frigates are free to deal damage of their own with their strong armament. When defending my base fortress, the fortress itself can take this role to a certain extent, but when I'm on the offensive, not so much. While the fortress can move, it's slow and I also want to keep it sitting in a resource zone and get money. If I go on the offensive with just madcats alone, I fear I would lose more ships than I could afford to replace. As with the campaign difficulty setting I choose, I don't get that much resources from damaging and destroying enemy ships. So even when I win a fight with the repair costs, I usually don't salvage enough to make much of a plus, and I can't afford to constantly rebuild ships from scratch. So I started designing something that can fulfill this role, and the result is the Excelsior class heavy cruiser named after my favorite Star Trek ship in case you wonder. So let me give you a bit of info on the ship. Now when I started out the idea was to build a cruiser, one that can go 1 vs 1 vs the enemy units that I faced in the Onyx Watch campaign, but without making it huge so that it stays affordable. Also having a unit that is 10 times bigger win a 1 vs 1 is much of a challenge. And I plan on slowly building up enough units to have a nice progression in the campaign from small units like my torpedo boat to larger ones, and hopefully have in the end my own quote unquote faction. Now, since I like the look of World War 1 vintage battleships, I took those as inspiration for the basic design of the Excelsior. The dimensions are more or less in line with a smaller pre-dreadnought battleship, specifically the Erzherzog Karl class, but with a more modern gun layout, like on the Degethoff or New Mexico class dreadnoughts. Being smaller than those though, the main armament are 12 9.4 inch guns in four triple turrets. One reason I classify the ship as a heavy cruiser and not a battleship. 9.4 inch guns are a bit larger than what you would usually find in a heavy cruiser, but for in the depth standards that's not very big. Now while the Excelsior looks like it is from World War 1 or World War 2, make no mistake, since it is meant to be a unit in the campaign and goes up against very effective designs, it also has some modern equipment, like missiles, laser based anti-missile systems as well as shields. The vital parts of the ship are also placed in an internal armored citadel, like one would expect. And the deck is only lightly armored, but it is armored. Now back to the armament though, on top of the 12 9.4 inch guns, I have two dual barrel 90mm dual purpose secondary guns, which at the moment are equipped with flak shells for anti-aircraft use, but the gun can also fire at other ships. The other way around, the main gun turrets are equipped with laser rangefinders that allow you to use fuses and flak shells themselves, so with the need arise I can fire some heavy AA shells out of the main guns as well. Below the 90mm gun turrets we have triple torpedo launchers, and in the bow, below the waterline, facing forward, there are two more torpedo tubes. And last but not least, in the rear behind the rear gun turret we have six vertical launch cells for radar guided missiles, which are optimized for speed and maneuverability and are the main air defense weapon of the ship. 
and for sensors in order to aim those weapons we got the usual mix of radar, infrared cameras and sonar. Well, let's take a quick look at the ship's internals. Up here we are in the ship's conning tower, which while armored is not as resilient as I would like, so controlling the ship from up there while in combat isn't a great idea, with a distinct possibility of getting a cram shell in the face. We got another command post in the ship's citadel for that. So let's start working our way down. Here on the superstructure we have the secondary gun we have just seen, and to the rear the bulge on the smokestack houses one of the shield generators of the ship. Other than that there isn't much on this level. Now one level below that we have the secondary gun's internals, which have three autoloaders each to keep up a somewhat decent rate of fire, but with the space here being limited there isn't much fancy stuff you can put on those turrets, since they still need space to rotate. Below that in the hull we find the engine room, which is as you would expect below the smokestack. Now the engine provides enough power to run the ship in combat mode of course, with all its shield generators running, but when I do further upgrades to the ship I might have to increase engine power a bit too. Now the engine room is on top of the citadel not in it, so it can get hit. I do however have extra electric engines inside the ship which have enough power to run the ship in combat mode for a while so the ship can fight with its full capability without the main engine. Now directly below the engine room is the AI core, and this one is in the best protected part of the citadel, and also surrounded by rubber to protect against EMP should an EMP charge get this far. Moving further back towards the stern of the ship, we get to the rear part of the citadel, with the internal command post including super sci-fi looking ship wheel. From here you can control the ship from the inside of the citadel. And looking up we can see one of the main gun turrets. I might have to put an armored ceiling in here to give overhead protection, in case the turret is lost, but for now it provides a nice view of the gun turrets. Behind that is the second turret, and one of my ammo customizers above the door, this one with an EMP round. And behind the door we have an electric engine with tons of batteries, again to provide power in case the engine room gets hit, and of course the second triple gun turret. Now the triple gun turrets are based on the ones of the Madcat, and they have some downsides, like the internals not being as slow in the citadel as I would like, and I might redesign them later, but that takes a while. Now that's the rear end of the citadel, behind it are the vertical launch cells which I don't consider critical enough to put them inside the citadel, armor is heavy after all. Now moving forward along the citadel we get to the front gun turrets, with two more ammo customizers, one with anti-aircraft shells for the secondary and one with the primary gun shells. I'm still experimenting with what's best for the main guns, but at the moment I use pretty standard armor piercing cap designs with a small high explosive charge in most main guns, though two of the rear guns are also equipped with EMP rounds. Below the guns we also have the ammo magazines, which are next to the AI core, the best protected part within the citadel, as well as some other resources like fuel. Now the rest of the internals are not within the citadel, for example the laser generator rooms, for the laser anti-missile system. Currently I have three emitters for the anti-laser system, one to port and starboard and one in front of the forward gun turret, with every emitter having its own laser generator for redundancy reasons. I might eventually change it though, we will see. Well, and here we are in the forward laser room. You can also see the outside of the citadel here and its wedge shape. Below that we have the torpedo room for the forward facing torpedo tubes, firing the same torpedoes I have on the Madcat, and below that the battery room. Well, that leaves only the rear of the ship with the vertical launch cells for the radar guided missiles as well as the fuel bunker in the rear storage room. So that's an overview of the Excelsior. I have to admit that was a little bit of work. So let's hop back in the campaign and see what we can do with it. Now having built the Excelsior in the campaign at the cost of having the Vulture put in the moth bars to get the resources, I decide I want to hopefully go to a more lucrative resource zone to build my forces up faster, and I know that there is another resource zone further north on the map with an enemy fortress in it, and I want to move my own up there. On the way there though I have two enemy fleets coming in to intercept me, and my fortress is too slow to run away from them. Now one of them is a smaller force with two pinnacle class ships, and one is a bigger one with two Ballstaff class ships, which I have not faced yet, but they are pretty large. Now I hoped at first that I can take out the two fleets one by one, but I set the battle range to the wrong setting I guess, and I'm facing both fleets at the same time. Now, the way those battles works is, depending on the situation, you have a limited amount of resources at the start to call in your units, and the rest comes in later as reinforcements when you get the resources to do so. 
In this case I can only bring the Excelsior in at first with the enemy having three ships, the Balstaff and two smaller ships. So I have to hold out and take them out with the Excelsior until the Mad Cat and my fortress come in as reinforcements to fight the second Balstaff ship. Now since the enemy ships are coming from two different fleets we have the smaller binnacles at close range with the Balstaff which I hoped would not be there at all further back. So far that I can't even see it in a storm at first. Now I start out with the weapons on AI control and the main guns engage the Balstaff at long range as the AI is set to prioritize larger targets with my shorter range torpedoes firing at the closer and smaller ships and I move to close in on the larger enemy vessel to hopefully damage it enough to knock out some of its weapons soonish. While I hope my secondary guns and torpedoes can take care of the smaller ships at the same time. They are not that well armed and don't worry me that much though. The heavier ball stuff with its heavy high explosive cram cannons though does, especially since those shells are coming in at a very high angle from above and can easily hit the weaker top armor of my turrets from above. This is also why I want to reduce the range so that they come in at a flatter angle. Now my anti-missile system tries to engage the heavy shells but while it is good at knocking out missiles and lighter shells it can't get those larger ones in time. I might have to upgrade those lasers. Also going straight for the enemy ship means that my heavy bow torpedo tubes can fire at it and they have a longer range than the smaller side ones. However I can't knock out the two smaller ships in time before they pass me and get behind my ship and now they do worry me a lot more as from behind they can hit the vertical launch cells of my missiles as well as my propulsion system so I change to manual gun control to get the main guns to bear on them. Which gets me some immediate results. The first ship I aim for pretty much blows out of the water and into two pieces. So I switch to the second one, hitting it with a mix of armor piercing capped ammo, some with high explosive payload and some with EMP payload. Which should work well enough versus metal targets like this. Now the secondary guns and torpedoes also fire on them and the second small ship is taken out of the fight quickly enough and I can focus on the main threat again after that. The green box you can see in the water by the enemy ships by the way is representing where I set up my fortress and where it will spawn when it comes in as reinforcements. The enemy ship still waiting to enter the fight is represented by a similar red one. And by now the larger enemy vessel is right next to me, but sadly as I feared the heavy crumb cannon shells coming down at an angle have hit the top of my forward turrets and taking them out. But I'm close enough to turn around and bring the rear wads to bear now and my little secondary gun is doing its part as well for what's that worse. Now the bar stuff must have taken a few hits from my forward torpedoes as well already and my guns quickly reduce its active weapons. So this enemy vessel is also soon not much of a threat anymore with most of its weapons taking out though it is still in a fight and still has a one gun or two. But by now I also can see some missiles hitting the enemy ship from behind my position indicating the arrival of my fortress and its weapons also. Sadly most of the fortress weapons are pretty short ranged and the fortress is too far behind to effectively use them as I set it up to counter the small fleet not realizing that the larger one further out would be in the fight as well. Still after a few more hits this ship is taken out but that also means that the last enemy ship still waiting will automatically come into the fight and that one is also a big one and spawning right next to my cruiser which is already damaged. However it is also designed to take a beating and with the last enemy ship arriving my own Mad Cat class frigate does so too. So with my cruiser already damaged and taking more hits from the newly arrived opponent I ordered to gain some distance while I take command of the Mad Cat to move in and finish the last enemy ship off. That takes a while the enemy vessel soaks up quite a few hits but eventually it is finished off and this is it for this fight. And I can take over the enemy fortress further to the north and the resource zone connected to it which turns out to be much worse than I hoped it would be. I eventually have to build up enough forces to control multiple ones. Well I think the Excelsior did what it was supposed to be in this fight and it would have been hard with just the smaller frigates. We took some damage but repairing that is a lot cheaper than building new ships from scratch. Still there are some improvements I look into in a more advanced subclass of the Excelsior I am planning, the Lakota class. But again I don't want the ship to get too expensive or too large. Well and this is it for this video and a little look at the Excelsior cruiser. As always I hope it was enjoyable, thanks for watching and maybe I'll see you next time.